All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Hi. We'll get started. Uh, so today, uh, by the way, I'm Trent. Nice to meet you all. It's really a pleasure to be here at HCC um, to um, join in and have a conversation with, with all of you folks about, um, about what we're up to, but also um, improving the overall ecosystem. And uh, my talk today is actually about that, um, based on some experiences that I, I've had and my team has had in the last year. Um, with respect to token design. And so let's get started. Uh, my title is Towards a Practice of Token Engineering. Uh, you might ask why there are jellyfish all over my slides and this one. Uh, I just think jellyfish are cool, frankly. Um, if an AI could be an animal, it would probably be a jellyfish. That's really the main reason. So uh, let's get started. Uh, let's see here. Maybe I'll just use the keys. Does that work? Hmm. There we go. So this key is now working. All right. Uh, technology. So uh, let's get started. So a bit of motivating slides around data and incentives, and of course, more jellyfish. Back in the late 90s, I, I had my very first job doing professional AI research. Uh, and I was overjoyed, right? People were paying money to basically play around with neural networks and evolutionary algorithms, all these sorts of things. And I was given a data set of 20,000 data points. And uh, I was told, um, go and classify um, between these 13 different classes. Um, and it was audio radar data. So there was, um, it was data from birds flying around and tanks driving around and so on. And the AI model had to classify between these. And I, I iterated and iterated. It, um, and initially, my initial models had 55% accuracy. That is 45% error. It was a summer job. So at the end of the summer, after four months of toil working 12-hour days, I was happy to do that because it was AI and I loved it. Um, I got it up to 65% accuracy. So um, within one summer of work, I improved the accuracy by 10%. That was still 35% error, which is unusable. And that was actually kind of the practice of how AI research was done in the 90s and even the early 2000s. Fixed size data sets and do what you can to try to come up with fancy algorithms to improve the accuracy, right? Now, um, something happened though. There was a paper that came out of Microsoft in 2001. And uh, this image is from the paper. And what it shows is something that is, frankly, super embarrassing to anyone who likes to design AI algorithms. Uh, what it shows is, on the x-axis is the number of data points, basically, number of words. The y-axis uh, y is accuracy. And basically, for years and years and years, we AI researchers were on the left axis. We had a fixed size data set. Um, we were right up there. We had a fixed size data set, and we were competing over 5% uh, error or 2% error. And all of our algorithms uh, were not performing, so there was very little AI that was actually shipping. But what these researchers said was, you know what? Instead of changing the algorithms, let's just add more data. And not just 10% more data, 10x more data, 100, 1,000x more data. And guess what? As more data was added, the models, of course, got better and better and better. So um, as you see, we went from 75% accuracy all the way up to 95, 97% accuracy. And the interesting thing was, it didn't really matter which algorithm you had. In fact, the simpler algorithms performed slightly better. This is super embarrassing, because people who have PhDs in AI algorithms, suddenly it's like it doesn't matter. Um, Google picked up on this in the mid-2000s. They wrote a paper called The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Data, where it referenced this work and a few other ones. And their modus operandi after that was go around and gather as much data as you can. What did they do? They went and bought satellite companies. They went and bought mapping companies, all of this, to gather more data, more data, more data. They call themselves an AI company. That's a head fake. They are a data company through and through. Now, why do they care about that? Well, if you have more data, then you have better accuracy, as we saw. And with that, if you're Google otherwise, then you can sell more ads, right? Higher click-through rate, all of that, right? So, and it, you get this data network effect of more data, more data, um, more accuracy, more money, and it's hard for people, anyone else, to catch up. You know, Microsoft has been chasing Google with Bing for more than a decade, unsuccessfully. Uh, so there's sort of this default incentive to hoard the data. You don't want to share it with other people because then their models will get accurate too, right? That's kind of the core problem. And so we have all these data silos now everywhere on the planet. And data itself is considered the world's most valuable resource. This is from an Economist article um, a year or so ago. 
And it all comes down to incentives, right? Charlie Munger, who worked with Warren Buffett for decades uh, with one of the world's most successful investment funds, says, show me the incentive and I will show you the outcome, right? So the question is, what can we do about the incentives here? What can we do about moving away from this incentive of siloing data? Well, blockchains are a funny thing. They are incentive machines. What you can do is you can get people to do stuff by rewarding them with tokens, magic internet money, right? This is a superpower, you know, there's lots of other cool benefits of blockchain, provenance and smart contracts and all this, but to me, the most powerful benefit of all is getting people to do stuff. So then, going back to the problem of data, let's change the incentives using an incentive machine, a blockchain, and let's change the incentives such that people want to pool the data rather than simply siloing it. They get benefit from that. And that is the underlying goal of wor what we're up to with Ocean Protocol. So we started working on Ocean Protocol, and I'm gonna describe a few early iterations that we had and some pain that we had, and then what we did about it. So uh, like all of you, I'm sure, we love to whiteboard, so we were drawing out. Um, this is an example of an early algorithm that we had, um, trying to address some concerns around, you know, if you have 10 people contributing 10 data sets, um, how does each data set contributor get paid? Can you defer the payment till the end, royalty style, all of that? So this is an example algorithm that uses some AI to extract impacts. And um, there's other things here too. We're starting to list uh, homework encryption and a whole bunch of other things, right? So lots and lots of whiteboarding, bring in friends from all around the world to iterate with and so on. Uh, also very early on, towards the first talk of the day, we wrote down goals and two of our main goals were a healthy ecosystem, not just initially, but long term, right? Um, and then also, all throughout this, maintain ethics and values, right? Um, that it was always absolutely critical to us. And we kept iterating, iterating, so this is that whiteboard expanded, a whole bunch of other things. You don't have to try to read my writing here, it's terrible, and this is also other people's writing. So iterating, iterating, right? Um, looking at multi-party compute and, and all this sort of thing too. Uh, and also looking at various pricing schemes with, with auctions, asking ourselves, you know, what if we had data that looked like Steemit? What if we approached data the way that Numerai does it? Um, et cetera, et cetera. So just lots and lots of iterations here and there, right? Um, and various sorts of designs. And as time went on, we started to actually distill a set of questions, right? So um, here on the top part, you see, how do we ensure that the data supplier gets paid? Um, what about the problem of free writing and so on? And on the bottom of this whiteboard, you'll see on the left, we're starting to list different signals. Uh, I'm an electrical engineer by trade, and in the world of electrical engineering, you have signals in terms of voltage or in current, and then there's other ways to view it. And then we started to write down different tools and patterns that we might use. This is the bottom right. So this was, we were starting to get there, but the challenge was it still felt like we were flailing, right? What is it that we were trying to achieve? When did, it, when did we know when we were done our token design, right? When should we move on from that sort of that first white paper to actually writing code? And so we asked ourselves, is there a way to structure this better, to look at this and improve uh, the process? And around the same time, I started to realize tokenized ecosystems are a lot like evolutionary algorithms. And um, I had spent a lot of time in the world of AI, including evolutionary algorithms. Roughly speaking, an evolutionary algorithm, or EA, is survival of the fittest, right? You can have a bunch of individuals running around, running around, doing whatever they want, and um, you, every generation, maybe you kill off 5% or 50%, the ones doing the worst, and you let the other ones make babies, um, have some mutations, some crossover, some changes, and you keep repeating, repeating, and repeating, and over time, you converge towards an answer. So that's the general idea of evolutionary algorithms. They go back to the 60s, um, independently invented in three different places, um, and they're actually wildly powerful, and Moore's Law is their friend too, by the way. So I realized that um, tokenized ecosystems were a lot like evolutionary algorithms. It wasn't just myself either. Uh, Sam de Rivier started to notice this too, and some others. So this, this table here shows you very explicit examples. So when you've got a tokenized ecosystem, you've got this block reward function. Guess what? That's just like the fitness function or objective function of an evolutionary algorithm. Um, so just like you're trying to say minimize the error of training a neural network, in the case of Bitcoin, you're trying to maximize the hash rate for security. And then when you go to measure this thing, how well is it doing in an evolutionary algorithm, you're measuring the fitness, right? Um, you know, what's the error? In the case of, uh, of tokenized ecosystem, it's really the proof, proof that something was done, some sort of proof of work, for example, right? You've got system agents, right? So um, in evolutionary algorithms, you've got these individuals, they run around, there's 50 of them or 5,000 of them, 
and they do their things, and you keep the good ones, you get rid of the bad. Um, well, with the world of blockchains, this is actually humans and actors, the miners, the token holders, and so on, right? They're running around, they're doing their thing. Um, and there's even a system clock, right? Um, in evolutionary algorithms, you have a generational update. You know, every generation, you, ha you make babies, you evaluate, et cetera. Um, and actually in blockchains, we generally have block reward intervals, right? Um, every 10 minutes for Bitcoin and so on. And finally, and this is the key thing, um, or another key thing, in the evolutionary algorithm for incentives, we can't control these individuals, right? They can mutate, they can cross over, they can do whatever they want, right? But what we can do is reward them for acting well, so let them make babies, reproduce, and so on, or the ones that are doing badly, um, you just kill them off, right? And it's amazing, with an evolutionary algorithm, even if you only kill off the worst 5% every generation, you get incredibly good performance, right? Well, we can actually have similar things in the world of tokenized ecosystems. Well, we do have similar things. We can reward by giving tokens, and we can punish by things like slashing stake or kicking out of a registry. There's other ways. So um, uh, rewards, and incentives, and disincentives. So when we realize this, we realize then, if these things are so similar, let's approach token design as optimization design. But that, of course, begs the question, what does optimization design look like? So um, luckily enough, I'd been doing this for a long time, designing evolutionary algorithms and um, CAD tools that had to embed these things to just work, right? And there's three steps if you want to design um, an optimizer um, that optimizes successfully. So the first thing is you write down the problem, you formulate the problem. This is the, the goals, which is objectives and constraints. Um, and it's the design space. I'll talk about each. Then you try an existing solver. You don't want to reinvent the wheel, right? So uh, um, you try it, and if needed, you try different problem, problem formulations or solvers. I'll talk about that. And then only if you needed do you design a new solver, right? Because otherwise you're just wasting time. So this was the steps. So formulating an objective uh, um, function and constraints, this is the, the canonical formulation up here. Um, the top thing, it says minimize fi, i equals one to nf. These are the objectives, the things you want to minimize or maximize. If you're designing a car, you might want to maximize top speed. You might want to minimize fuel consumption. And then subject to constraints, inequality or equality constraints. So an inequality constraint might say power consumption has to be less than 10 milliwatts. Um, or uh, the equality constraint might be um, if you've got a car, maybe uh, no matter what, the tire diameter is 17 um, uh, inches. And then you also design a design, you have a design space, sort of where the optimizer can run around, right? So this is formulating the problem. There is an art to doing this. Um, it's not easy. And actually, interestingly, in the next step, as you're trying the different solvers, um, if the solver doesn't converge, if it doesn't do a good job, you have some options. You can try different solvers, but you can also reformulate the optimization problem. So in the world of optimization, for example, in the late 90s, people figured out how to um, solve convex problems in polynomial time. This was a big breakthrough, but because before that, we could only solve linear problems in, in uh, polynomial time. Convex means one big hill. Uh, but before that, they didn't have a way to do it. So that was really great because there was this big um, uh, push by people to try to figure out how do you formulate a whole bunch of problems in convex form so you could solve them very quickly. So, uh, or maybe your solver doesn't work very well, so you try to use another one, right? Maybe instead of an evolutionary algorithm, you use stochastic gradient descent or something. And if it does well in the end, it converges. So this is an example here of, uh, of an evolutionary algorithm running over 500 generations, trying to minimize um, its, uh, its objective function. And uh, if it turns out that you can't solve it, um, it just doesn't work, then you need to design a new solver, right? So this is an example of a solver that is I designed in a paper from about 10 years ago, and it just happened to be it, um, addressing the problem that I needed to solve. There, at, the, at the time, there was no really good way to have something that could search through a grammatically constrained um, space um, in a way that wouldn't get stuck easily. So this, this solver basically did that um, as an example. And then if you're successful, um, at the end of your um, optimization run or runs, um, you get really cool results. So this is an example where you have two objectives, maximize the gain bandwidth and minimize power. So the ideal thing is down on the bottom right, the, the ideal point, but there's always trade-offs. So in this case, every single dot you'd see is a different result um, that worked. But this is an example of an optimization or three optimization runs that worked really, really well, right? So if you are successful in the design of these optimizers, you get good results. So back to token design. Remember, we realized token design looks like optimization design. I've laid out what does optimization design look like. So let's apply the same steps, roughly speaking, to token design. 
What are they again? Formulate the problem, try an existing pattern, not solver, and design new patterns. <laughs> and a pattern is a building block, and they can be various levels of the hierarchy. I'll talk about that. So these are the three steps. What does this look like for token land? Let's go through them. So formulating the problem, right? Um, in this case, we have to first of all ask, you're trying to come up with the objectives and constraints, right? Ask, who are your stakeholders, right? What do each of them want? And also, what are the different attack vectors? Because every single attack vector is gonna turn into a constraint. Do I prevent this, yes or no, right? And, and then from that, you can translate these things into objectives and constraints. I, I will give examples in this later for Ocean, by the way. Um, and then trying existing patterns, right? So we actually were enum enumerating our own lists of patterns that are out there, and there's actually quite a few emerging. Some people are calling these crypto-economic primitives. I like the word patterns because it goes back to design patterns in, in software or architecture. Uh, so some examples, are, there's a bunch of patterns for curation. Um, there's patterns for, for proofs of compute work, et cetera. There's also patterns for identity, for reputation, for governance, for third-party arbitration, and more, right? And uh, within each of these, you have to ask, you know, is this appropriate for me? Sometimes they might form the core of your system, or, or they might be bulletins that you have on the side um, towards uh, addressing a particular attack vector, for example. Let's drill in on a couple. So curation, uh, we've seen in the last year, even the last six months, that token curated registries just took off, right? ETH Denver, or something like a third of the, the projects used TCRs. Um, great, you know, that's very, very cool because if it works, that's all you need, right? Um, but it doesn't just stop at TCRs, right? You can actually say, what if we want to promote people, just like people going from early Wikipedia contributors to higher and higher levels of editors, right? You can go from, um, you can get promoted, and there's something out there called stake machines that does that. So it's, it's a generalization of TCRs for that. Or you can also have continuous valued membership, right? This is um, curation markets, right? And they're characterized by a bonding curve. Um, and you can even go further. You can actually have hierarchical membership. And this is something we realize. You can actually I introduce labels, which are, are very popular in, in AI, actually. Um, something that I'll talk about later um, is uh, proofed curation markets. So with Ocean, it turned out that none of these other patterns quite worked for what we needed. So we actually did use, we had to invent a new pattern, but it's something that can get deployed elsewhere. I'll talk more about that. And more recently, um, some folks introduced something called refungible tokens which is um, taking uh, non-fungible um, tokens and uh, adding um, fungibility. So this is an example of just emerging patterns for just curation, right? But of course, there's other things too, such as the patterns for proofs of work. And within a subset of that, there's proofs of compute work. So we went in and actually uh, enumerated these, right? Um, subsets, there's work around data and there's uh, work around computation itself. Within data, we've got, for example, proof of space time, which is famous within uh, Filecoin but there's also proof of replication, um, proof of data availability, which is a subset of proof of space time, and more. Same thing for computation. There was talks about in earlier talks on this. Things like zero knowledge proofs, and there's subsets of that, ZK Starks, ZK Starks, or interactive proofs, like homomorphic encryption, and so on and so forth. So there's a whole bunch of patterns out there, and it's really useful to understand these, to have these in your toolbox when you're doing token design. So with this flow, these, these three steps I talked about, um, Let's start analyzing, um, let's, let's use this in a case study to look at a little bit of Bitcoin, and then on the heels of that, I'm going to drill into a full-on flow for how we went about a systematic approach to designing Ocean. So Bitcoin, Bitcoin actually has an objective function. Its objective function is to maximize the security of the Bitcoin network, right? It defines security as hash rate, which is compute power, which is electricity, right? Um, and overall, um, it's making it super expensive in terms of electricity spend. It's super expensive to roll back changes to the transaction log. That's basically what Bitcoin is trying to do, right? You can even actually formulate it, write it as an objective function like I have here, where the expected value of the block rewards, i.e. Um, your chance of getting Bitcoin in this case, it, uh, is proportional to the hash power of your actor, which is your contribution to security, your work function, and um, times the token dispensed at that block in that time interval, right? So this is actually the Bitcoin reward function expressed as an objective function, right? And I say expected value on the left because um, it's, it averages out over time, right? If you actually want to have a very low variance, you join a, a mining pool at the top. But overall, um, you know, it's very lumpy otherwise at the lowest level. How well did it work, Bitcoin's in incentives? Well, this is a picture of a, a, a mining center, right? Um, um, ASIC farm. So people are maximizing security, that is. People are maximizing electricity. 
and um, the, the sheer power of incentives of Bitcoin, it's going to use more, it's on track to use more power than USA by mid-2019. Isn't that incredible? It's already using more power than most small countries, right? But by mid-2019, more than all of USA. And this is, by the way, a for better or for worse thing, right? There's big debates about this. But it shows the sheer power of incentives. But also, when you're designing these things, think about the ethics and the values and what might come out of this, right? Let's now talk about ocean uh, and the, the going through ocean design as a case study. So first of all, formulating the problem, we actually wrote down the list of the different stakeholders. So they are uh, the people with the data, the service providers, the custodians, all of that. The people doing the referring slash curating. Um, and this, by the way, could be data exchanges and so on too. There's people verifying the data, making sure that it's good, that it's uh, not failing and so on. There's people consuming the data. And finally, there's the keepers or the miners, right? And each one of them has gives and gets, right? So for example, the data service providers, well, they're providing the data. What do they get in return? Well, uh, probably some form of tokens, ocean tokens, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So for each of these stakeholders, they have a give and a get. Um, this is just the key stakeholders, by the way. We, we have another 10, but most of them um, actually aren't as important, especially in the core of the system, right? So you have to remember there's things that will be on-chain and, and off-chain, and there can be a whole ecosystem around. Think about Bitcoin, right? At the core of Bitcoin, it's super simple. But this whole ecosystem is formed around Bitcoin with wallets and miners and pools and exchanges and all of this, right? So it's really important to understand that. And um, a key part of this is where do you want to be, um, where should your stakeholders be playing a role in the core network? So in terms of formulating the problem, once you've got the stakeholders, then it's translating into objectives and constraints, right? So for Ocean, um, it actually came down to a phrase that we repeat to ourselves again and again and again, maximize the supply of relevant data, right? And you'll see shortly that generalizes services too. Um, so overall, we wanted at first reward, token rewards if you supply relevant data. The thing is, how do you know what relevant data is? So very quickly we realized we have to leave that to the crowd, right? So the crowd actually has to play a curation function on the data itself. So really it's token rewards if you supply data and curate it. And by supply, I don't mean just publish, but I mean also make it available. So, um, and that was sort of the high level objective, but we had a whole bunch of constraints. And at the highest level, we distilled into seven constraints. So for priced data, is there an incentive for supplying more data? Is there an incentive for referring? Um, is there good spam prevention, right? Because you don't want to pay people um, every time they submit data, uh, even if it's junk data, that would just, that's garbage, right? So that, that's for priced data. But with Ocean, we also want to incentivize the data commons, right? Um, so for free data, the data commons, is there incentive for supplying more? Is there incentive for referring? Is there good spam prevention, right? Besides that, we also want to um, incentivize for actual actors in the ecosystem rather than just the hodlers, right? So what this means, uh, in the words of Fred Ursam, does the token give higher margin of value to the users of the network versus external investors, right? Um, or another way of framing it, uh, or a specific way is, do you, does the return on capital increase as stake increases, right? And then other things, are people actually incentivized to run keepers? Is it simple or as simple as possible? Is onboarding low friction? So these were the key constraints or checklist we had. But then beyond that, we actually just brainstormed and brainstormed and grouped the ideas. So, you know, uh, what other objectives do we have towards good acting via staking, identity, reputation, and so on? Um, what are the list of attacks? We actually have three pages of attack that we attacks that we've written down. So, um, so just page after page of attack. Um, others have made checklists too. Willie McGuire made a checklist more of sort of token economics related, but it turned out to be quite useful too. So, um, just long checklists. Um, and finally, of course, the key values. Um, so we actually wrote down the key things we wanted there, too. This really matters to us, right? So uh, it's really important for the unlocking of data and the human right to personal data privacy and consent, but also the spread of power and the spread of value, right? We've seen some, uh, some token launches out there where um, one actor got 20 or 30 or 40% um, of the initial um, tokens offered, and that does not spread the value, right? So what can you do about that? Uh, and then some other things too, things like uh, resilience, work with the law, et cetera. So that was the step one, right? Formulate the, the, the problem, right? The objectives, the constraints, the design space. And then try some existing patterns. As you guys saw, um, there's a lot of patterns out there, subsets of subsets. So here's some ones we looked at, right? Take a TCR, token curated registry, for just actors, right? Um, the good players versus the bad, so only the good ones are in there. Um, and some, some um, systems out there do a nice job. Ad chain, I, I really respect them for having just that on chain and everything else is off chain, right? That's pretty cool. So we asked, could we keep, could it be as simple as that, right? Or what about just for data, right? 
Or what if we had a registry for actors and for data? Just that, right? Um, and, and maybe bring in some curation market stuff, right? So this was some initial patterns that we looked at. And uh, of course, what do you do with these, right? How do you know whether they're good or not? Well, guess what? We have our objectives and constraints, right? So here, uh, we actually, uh, these key questions we asked, for the price data, is there an incentive for supplying more, referring, right? Well, for that first design, the actor's registry, it actually doesn't, there's no incentive. It doesn't help there, right? Um, for that first design, the actor's registry, it actually does an okay job in spam prevention. It doesn't help for um, supplying free data as well. So it's failing on some things, passing on others, right? And so each of these designs, you can see there's some passes, but there's some fails. There's some Xs or so-so, right? So of all the different sort of patterns that we looked at initially against these constraints, um, they weren't working. They weren't working. So we started saying, what other new patterns can we introduce? What minimal changes can we make um, in order to address our concerns? And we, we started realizing that if we bound together the actual work of making data available with curation, that's a new pattern, and it, it's very powerful because it's com uh, combining um, a prediction of something having relevance with something actually being relevant or popular. And we had a couple of variants of this, and the, the variant number six is what we're calling a proofed curation market. And so then, against the constraints, we see variant number six is that actually hits the checklist for every single one of these goals. Once we got through this, then we went through the longer checklists, and it turns out to do a nice job there, too, after some tweaks here and there and here and there, right? So this is actually how we arrived at this. Th this particular design was actually initially flailing, 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 then formulating the problem very tightly, having key questions to ask, and then trying different patterns and iterating. Um, coming down to, I showed you the objective function for Bitcoin. This is the one for Ocean, actually. And what this is, is we're trying to reward curating of data and making it available, right? Um, so on the left is the expected reward for the I user ac uh, I on data set J. And then the yellow is the pr um, a reward proportion. The reward is proportional to predicted popularity, which is how much stake you have in the curation market. Are you putting your money where your mouth is? But um, on its own, curation markets, they can flail um, if it's not tied to actual work, depending on the application. So we tied the predicted popularity with the proofed popularity, which is actually, did you make the data set available when asked, right? So, um, and that's the yellow, uh, the, the green here, sorry. Uh, by the way, the log stuff is in there in order to avoid um, stake whales. You, you don't want the rich get richer in a strong way. So log actually turns out, it, it um, AI folks use it all the time for diversity, and it actually has relevance with something called the Kelly criterion in, in economics. So um, that's the core of it, and then we've got the tokens during the interval, and then the far right, there's this R thing, and this is actually an extra term we have to prevent a couple of tacks that we tacked on later. But overall, the core is, uh, for Ocean is, did you predict, did you put your money where your mouth is for something being relevant, and then was it actually relevant, right? That's the core. Um, but we had one more constraint, if you saw on the checklist before, and that was, what about privacy, right? And it turns out that for certain problems, um, the only way to address privacy properly is on-premise compute, right? Um, also, though, as we were iterating, a lot of data is super heavy. You can't actually, you don't, it's a petabyte um, or more, and you really don't want to move it. So that's another reason to have on-premise compute. Uh, we also realized there's a lot of um, emerging uh, networks out there uh, for, for data, for compute, and so on. Is there a way where we can hook into that and, and basically grow together as an ecosystem together? And what we realized was we could generalize what we've been building um, rather than just maximizing the supply of relevant data. It could be relevant uh, services, which includes data and compute. For our case, tuned towards AI. And so overall then, the objective function um, simply changes from instead of predicted popularity of the data, just data, it's for the service. And same thing for the proofed popularity. And like you saw before, we actually have proofs for not just data, but for compute, right? So we knew we could leverage those patterns. So the core design of Ocean did not change that way, but um, by generalizing in just a specific way, it addressed these new challenges. So overall, as I was iterating on this, just in the last few weeks, actually, we've started to realize that there's a new label needed for this, right? Um, so out there, there's actually a field that's been around for forever. Um, there's game theory, which is really about analysis of tokenized ecosystems or, and other things. And then, but there's, there's a synthesis side too, which is mechanism design, right? The thing is, a lot of the mechanism designers and, and uh, stuff out there, this is really um, people in this science, not engineering discipline of economics. And how often do you get a chance to actually deploy an economy? It's pretty rare, right? But if you think about it, um, optimization design, people are deploying optimizers all the time, right? Um, there's actually a big practice around that. 
How do they relate? Well, it turns out that if you take ideas from mechanism design, that framing, and add just a few constraints, it actually ca it casts into the problem of optimization design. So this is very cool. These fields directly relate, right? But I also saw that, like, where is the engineering theory, practice, tools, right? Um, where is the responsibility that you take on if you're an engineer? Like Canadian engineers, we get iron rings so that we always remember. And if, if you start doing this, then you take the optimization design framing and it actually turns into um, what I hope will emerge as its own engineering discipline, engineering discipline, token engineering. And this is what I see. So it's sort of going from this science, uh, economics, which is game theory and mechanism design, to engineering, uh, which has um, overall engineering has this goal of building systems that just work. So, to conclude, uh, I have a dream, a vision, of a, a, a practice of token engineering. How can we get there? Token design looks a lot like optimization design. By doing that, we can actually have a process for designing these tokenized ecosystems, formulating the problem, objectives, constraints, design space, trying existing patterns, iterating, don't invent if you don't have to, right? And only if needed, you try a new design, right? Iterating, iterating there. Um, this helped a lot for Ocean, we've seen, so far. Uh, we haven't deployed it yet, so I'm not going to make any grand claims that way. Um, and overall then, token engineering is theory and practice and tools and responsibility towards design of tokenized ecosystems. That's token engineering. Thank you. Thank you for the nice talk. Uh, you seem to move the engineering on the to token side, uh, a lower hierarchical level of uh, mechanism design. So the question is, uh, in, in what way we can engineer the mechanism design to achieve the complexity uh, of, the, of the system? Yeah, so uh, it's not on a lower level. How I see it, there is, uh, uh, mechanism design is really within the field of economics, which is really a science, right? And science is really about answering questions and gaining knowledge for humanity, right? Engineering is about building practical systems that work. So I, I see that the uh, mechanism, like what I have a dream of is the mechanism designers working very closely with this sort of emerging field and maybe in the end it will be called just mechanism design, maybe just token engineering, I don't know, but engineering has a lot to say in terms of the ethics and how to approach this stuff, right? So um, I, I see that th it's side by side science and engineering. Um, and then overall in terms of complexity, um, within engineering, um, obviously in engineering you can have wildly complex systems if you want, right? Like a chip, you know, people design chips, uh, a team of 10 engineers can design a chip with 10 billion transistors in a matter of months because they have the right theory and practice and tools, right? Um, I see that here. Uh, we want to keep the designs right now pretty simple because we don't have very good tools. And instead, we want emergent complexity above, right? So Bitcoin itself, the core design, is super simple, right? So from very simple rules, we get this complex system. And that's actually what complex systems theory has a lot to say there. Um, so in general, we, we should be always trying to strive to keep things as simple as possible, um, but no simpler. So thank you. Hi. Uh, so. Uh, here, so in Ocean, you've taken care of the uh, popularity with your token incentives. Uh, what about quality? So, for example, I don't know, uh, the New York Times versus BuzzFeed. Yeah, so um, overall, this is actually one challenge we still have. Uh, we'd like to have, when we say relevant, right now we're measuring relevant as popular. Um, which is not ideal. Th there's actually a lot of metrics for relevance within the world of data, um, as well as sort of information theoretic measures too, all this sort of thing. Um, we don't have a great answer there yet. Uh, so overall, uh, we're leaving basically people, when they're, when they're betting on something, are they betting on it being popular or relevant? We don't know. Now, if that data is um, valuable, then people will want to be maybe wanting to sell it. So you can actually incorporate the relevance on the priced side of things above that. Uh, Ocean itself, if you've noticed, actually, uh, it doesn't actually do the, the pricing stuff itself. That would be for data marketplaces that emerge on top. Ocean is just incentivizing uh, uh, um, for data, whether it's um, priced or, or commons data, either way. So I guess to answer your question, we don't have a great measure of relevance um, yet. Um, the, b the best is just knowing that it's staking, but for price data, then relevance comes implicitly in, in, um, one level up. 
And if any of you guys has ideas on how to get to relevance in a better way, please come talk to me. One other thing too, in general, uh, please come talk to me if you're interested in this idea of token engineering at all and contributing to patterns and whatnot. I do hope to um, build a community around this actually, just with uh, all, all of us together. This is something that can really you know, help the whole community. Question. Uh, thank you. So uh, I'm wondering uh, how much uh, uh, the fact that people try to get information from this creates a feedback which distorts the information. So this herd behavior that people vote for things that other people vote for uh, might create, so d do you think that it's, it's irrelevant? Like it, it doesn't, doesn't uh, distort the measures that you're trying to g glean out of this? Yeah, so um, that was certainly a challenge, and actually that's part of the reason that we brought in the data availability. So um, if you actually, it's not just curating, because if you have just a curation market, it, um, it, with just that straight out, that encourages a lot of pump and dump stuff, right? Even if you have um, uh, like cost in there of selling and stuff, but it, once you bind uh, the curation with the work, then the only way for people to really extract value well is the, if, if they start serving up that data too, right? So um, that actually implicitly covers for it. So forcing people to actually do work to contribute to the system means that they're contributing to the system in the, the way that the system wants, right? So it, this is why it's so important to actually ask yourself, like, what, do, what does the system want, right? Um, and then optimize to that. Yeah. But great question. Victor. Uh, we're going to need a mic. Thanks. Thanks. I can try to shout. So. Uh, Basically, popularity and all these measures are um, hinge on the hinge on the assumption that you know somehow somehow you can track the access to the data. So the 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 age old problem of of, of of piracy. So basically, with digital data, once you reveal it, you can you can uh, you can distribute it and make it available for others, either in a secondary market or just just for for the fun of it, make it available. So is 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 the I mean, this problem occurs in. All, all other uh, fields, of course, it's not not specific to yours. But do you have a, do you have like a hunch on like how how you how you want to solve it, or is it is it gonna be solved? Does it have to be solved? Is it going to be what? Do you think it needs to be solved, or, or solved as in as in somehow you have to take care that 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 uses of the, of a particular set of data is kept in the system so that you can record its popularity. So. Basically, basically, data piracy. Okay, so actually, in that, I see uh, two uh, related questions. One is, um, uh, you know, th this concern towards proving that the data was made available and so on, and that's why um, this is where the cryptographic proofs are really key. Um, so actually, we look forward to leveraging Swarm as one of the that supplying one of those proofs, right? Um, as well as uh, so, so hurry up. <laughs> no, but overall, uh, you know, this I also reference, you know, proof of space time and, and other stuff or light, more lightweight ones. You know, Jason Toish uh, just wrote a paper on uh, data availability, which is a simpler problem than proof of space time, right? So overall, um, there's uh, the proof that the data was made available, and you only get paid once it's proven, right? On the other question of uh, what if, um, basically, there's there's different attack vectors, and you hinted at one um, around uh, if people maybe get the data set and then spread it around outside of the system, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So data, data leakage, data escapes. There's lots of words, and um, so uh, there's there's two answers to that. One of them is um, uh, for certain types of data, you can just let go, and it's like, okay, fine, it's out there. Uh, you have to let go, and just knowing that um, it, 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 it's there. You know, like when iTunes um, took away DRM, guess what? Nothing happened P because it was convenient enough and the system was good enough that people were still incentivized to use um, I iTunes, um, which is actually wonderful, right? A wonderful result. Um, if it really matters that you don't want the data to escape, this is where you can actually, uh, Ocean, by the way, the, the, the data, it, it doesn't care where the data is stored. It can be on-premise behind a firewall. It can be decentralized, it can be centralized. For, su for super sensitive data, maybe it needs to meet GDPR standards or whatever, or German medical data needs to be um, on German soil, then uh, keep it on German soil. And uh, so if you have concerns, of really strong concerns about data escapes, this is the way, right? Um, so Ocean, it's very flexible in terms of where the data is is served from, as well as it's flexible on where the compute is, right? Um, 
and that's on purpose. This is why it's this, this framing, this sort of decentralized data hub of data and services. Vaughn. Hey, um, this question is about the two different types of models you're trying to kind of perpetuate. One is around the data commons, which will have a different effect on the price of the ocean token compared to priced data. Um, and I think it's kind of similar to the data escapes problem. If you're if you're always trying to build a data marketplace and data kind of has this property where it always tries to be free or kind of the end, end state is you kind of create this downward pressure, um, doesn't doesn't everything trend to free over time? And um, and how does that affect the token? Yeah. So um, I mean, one one way of so s this is a great question. Thank you. And uh, overall, there's the question of. There, you're, you're getting value um, at the level of ocean, uh, whether the data is free or priced, but then does that conflict with the price data one level up, right? And uh, we wanted to make sure that it was uh, that ocean itself was a unified framing for free versus uh, priced data, right? And this is why we arrived at this level. It also means that uh, there's ways to compensate creators directly. If they have something good, they stake on it early, all of this, just like people mining Bitcoin early, they're gonna get more. And you know, there's been some really nice articles recently on, on Medium about like designing bonding curves around this and stuff too to really help um, uh, compensate the creators sort of at the at, at this base level, right? And I actually see, um, you know, there's this classic problem, uh, Stuart Brand problem of uh, information wants to be free, it also wants to be expensive, right? The free part is the physics of bits. They want to copy, copy, copy. The expensive part is because you want to compensate creators. The cool thing is we actually have a whole new answer to that now because there's this magic internet money <laughs> that gets printed that can go directly to the creators, right? Um, which is actually kind of cool, independent of whether the data is priced or not. So we kind of have a new deal for compensating creators. And you know, this strikes to my very heart too in a great way, going back to a scribe days, compensating creators. Um, to your, related to this all, um, then there's the question of the priced versus not priced data. Um, my view is, ideally, most things move towards being free for humanity, and uh, the price stuff gets squeezed out, um, frankly. I would love that. But there are times and places where price still makes a difference. So this is kind of how I see things. And I'm completely OK if price gets squeezed out. Great, right? Hi, um, I'm curious to hear your thoughts about um, uh, incentivizing different behaviors in a, in a complex ecosystem like Ocean, right? Like there's incentivizing the, the value of the data itself. There's incentivizing the running of the infrastructure that provides the data. There's probably some kind of reputation ba uh, baked in. Just having, you know, token registry at all is kind of a representation of, of um, yeah, reputation. So why um, why incentivizing all uh, why incentivize all of those different uh, mechanisms with the same denomination of value instead of using few different uh, a few different denominations? Yeah, so um, great question. Uh, one of the th there's th there's a few reasons why we chose what we did. We saw actually early on that um, with the AI data. Um, it's really a supply side problem. Um, you know, if you talk to any data scientist, any AI researcher, they'd be like, yes, I'll take 10x or 100x more data, please, I want it yesterday, right? So th that part is actually easy um, in terms of the demand or easier, right? The supply side is much harder because you've got these big corporations that have, you know, petabytes of data that they don't know what to do with and they're very antsy about letting it out because of privacy reasons or they just don't know or whatever. Um, and also even, you know, there's lots of different open data sets, but they're not incentivized even to share their stuff right now. So for Ocean, it actually was more about the supply side th than the demand side. Um, so y if you look at the objective function for Ocean, it's actually maximizing supply, not demand. And that's a, an explicit design on purpose. Now that said, there's still the challenge overall of, you know, we've got the people that we want to do the keeping, we've got the people that we wanted to be supplying, and so on and so forth. And one option was, we looked at this design where we have, um, uh, a token reward if you do keeping, or if you do this, or if you do that, and so on. And uh, we, but there's attack vectors for that because um, it might be that people maybe it's you have 20% to the keeping and 20% to this, and so on. Um, there's attack vectors there that's pretty easy to game in many ways. So we said, you know what, we're going to bind this all together. So if you actually want to get um, paid, you're running a keeper node that you're and you're curating, you're staking, and you're supplying. It's all bound together into basically one actor in the end. Yes, there's different roles, but we're binding into one actor. Um, there, all, for all the other actors in the ecosystem, um, they, uh, they aren't part of the, the token design itself. However, I think it's really, really important 
one, one thing that lets you sort of fudge your way through this in a, in a powerful way is making sure that all the actors have, have tokens, right? Uh, and that way you're aligning the interests of everyone. So, so this is why, for example, with Ocean, a, as we're growing the community and stuff, we're, we're uh, making sure that there's tens of thousands of people involved, and we actually have community greater than 10,000 already w around this, and there will be airdrops and all this sort of thi thing too, um, we, we expect. Um, so it doesn't, overall, that's the way of aligning all the various stakeholders over time, right? And ultimately, the main way is simply, like, are they happy with the system? Is it working? Is it useful, right? But um, it, with the token design, I think you have to be very, very careful. If you're going to um, have token rewards for more than one role, um, there is a bunch of attack directors. You've got to be super careful there, right? Um, and we're not, like, keep in mind, too, you can have, um, if it turns out that we want to incentivize demand side better, well, maybe you have a network on top somehow, right? Or maybe you, there's a whole bunch of different possibilities for design. So we're seeing the emergence of uh, tokens with, sorry, ecosystems with two tokens, right? Like a stable coin and something else. So we're open to all this. Um, we're just we're trying to keep it simple now, but, but who knows, right? None of this we see as cast in stone. Um, we're going to iterate, iterate, um, measure, and so on. Um, uh, I have a question about iteration, actually. So you, you talked about, um, I mean, just in drawing the equivalence between token engineering and optimization design. So when you're doing optimization design on something like a, like a printed circuit or, or a, a well-defined problem, um, a diode or, or a resistor behaves in the same way and that's very easy to simulate and so you can do many, many iterations. But if you're trying to design a token economy, people don't behave in predictable ways. And so I, I wonder if you have any thoughts on how you iterate with economies and how you iterate uh, with a token design when you can't really do that many experiments or do that many iterations. Agreed. So um, I view this as a great challenge. It's a great question actually. Um, it, it turns out actually circuit design, while it's a closed system, it's actually really hard to model well. So even if you're trying to like uh, synthesize an analog circuit or something, um, uh, it's actually really hard to have constraints such that um, it's not giving you completely wonky designs like Rube Goldberg machines. And, and I, I know this super well because this was my PhD thesis and I was actually banging my head against the wall for years trying to, to, to solve this and I cracked it uh, eventually. But um, so, so even for circuits, it's actually hard to capture everything which is maybe a bit of a hint of the solution. That said, you know, when you've got a more open loop system where you've got humans involved, and humans, you, you can't always predict humans because we would have to model the brains of everybody and that's just going quite crazy, then what, right? And um, so it, it's a great question. Um, some, and I've been iterating with several people about this over the last few weeks, you know, and there's high variance in opinions, right? Um, one friend, he, he tells me, this, trend, this is impossible, this is fantasy land, right? Other friends are like, I'm going to build a simulator tomorrow on this, I'm going to do my best, right? And I see that uh, overall, um, we, can, we, should, we need to try, right, for starters, because if we don't try, we end up with more things like Bitcoin, you know, this life form that's eating the energy of the planet, right? I, I don't want that anymore, right? So if we can try, if we can anticipate these, um, great. So there's a near-term solution and then a medium-term. The near-term solution is something that we're doing, and I'm seeing other groups doing this too. Um, with Ocean, we had a draft white paper, and then we would send it to a few friends who really get the stuff, and they would attack it in various ways, like, what about this, what about that? We would add that to the list of attacks, we would update the design to fix it. And we kept doing this again and again and again, right? And we're seeing other groups doing this too, um, you know, the TrueBit guys, the OS coin guys, and so on. And I think that's actually a really great practice, because then you're, you're adding constraints. Um, at the end of the day, though, um, uh, hopefully that's enough, but I think also even when you deploy the system, you might s find new attacks. The system itself needs to be evolvable enough, right? So um, the good thing is, even by default, like hard forks are a path to evolving. It can be painful, but it's working. We're seeing on-chain governance maybe starting to work, things like Dashcoin and stuff, great. I don't know what the right answer there is, but overall, you know, some form of governance, whether it's hard forkish or something a bit more involved, um, that's going to be crucial to actually adapting to the system. Um, I also am hopeful too, um, but beyond just iterating with friends and stuff, I do hope that we get something like a token simulator, a token economy simulator. Um, and it, it could be like agent-based simulation, things like we've had seen before, but these agents then, how do you design the agents, right? And um, maybe you can turn that into a game on its own where humans get involved, maybe it's mechanical Turk style, where actually part of the simulation is actually people trying to attack in various ways. And then maybe bit by bit by bit, you bounty it up towards the, the launch of the network itself, right? Because you have to incentivize people well enough. If they come up with a great attack um, that they're getting paid maybe a thousand bucks for, um, uh, would they do that or would they wait till the system goes live and make a million dollars, right? 
So uh, how, do you, how do you use that? And I think that there's a lot to be said with bounties for bugs, sort of like um, um, cobalt.io does, right? Um, but more towards token bugs. So there's bugs in terms of the formal verification, it's more contract part, but what about the token dynamics bugs, right? And it's like digital versus analog design. So overall, I, I see pieces, right? To summarize, um, iterating with friends to attack you, um, evolvability in the system itself via governance, and then finally, token simulation itself that includes human in the loop, right? One other thing I should mention, uh, these things here that I'm talking about, I actually wrote a blog post that came out last week that discusses a lot of this in length. So, um, and like before too, if any of you guys has interest in iterating more on this, uh, let's do this. Uh, let's, let's, you know, form, you know, community around this. Uh, thanks, Trent. First of all, amazing presentation. Really enjoyed it. Uh, so my question is, um, I think as more and more protocols emerge that have specific use cases, uh, like like Ocean, for example, for the for the exchange of data, uh, interoperability is going to become an increasing um, topic. And now, as we see different protocols interoperate and kind of use each other's functionalities, those um, sort of those protocols have their own token systems and incentives, obviously. How can we, in, in sort of token engineering, take like other token economies into account? So like bake in the, the concept of token interoperability and the, the incentives from one moving from one protocol to another into the actual design before even launching it. Is wow. Uh, if you have an answer to that, please <laughs> tell me, I, or if anyone does. That's, that's a great question. I don't know. Um, I do see that you know, interoperability is actually at the heart of Ocean, too, um, because we're trying to talk to, like, iterate with um, these other networks, right? So we want compute coming from Golem, or from SingularityNet, or from Enigma. And we want um, data coming from Swarm and from Filecoin and all these, right? It's actually really important. And then uh, we, we, are, we see that there's interoperability protocols emerging, right? Interledger, Cosmos, Polkadot, all of these. Truebit is a glue technology, too. Um, so each of these, uh, the, the near term is we're not going to have tokens that incentivize this overall um, yet. Uh, there's a sub-challenge, too. If, if someone's using Ocean and they want to make a call to, say, Golem, um, how do those get paid for? And, you know, there's... The good thing is there's um, decentralized exchanges happening and built into things like Infura and stuff too. That's actually uh, very nice, uh, that, but that's not about the incentive, that's just about interoperating. So um, I, I don't know, but maybe there's something around like baskets of currencies maybe, right? Like prism style. So uh, if any of you have ideas yourself or others, please let's talk about it. That's a great idea actually. We talked about I think that um, we can learn from the kind of real company world where I think um, in, in music, um, Spotify and Tencent Music did like a share exchange. So I think seeing projects who do an active exchange of their tokens could be really interesting because they're incentivized to actually build across protocols and um, I'm sure those things could be quite quite interesting to explore. That's a great idea, yeah. The share swap taking a token land, right? Um, and a, 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 a token network that's incentivizing share swaps across, that would be amazing, right? <laughs> so. This is a very hot QA session, so I will accept more questions. Um, it is the last conference in, uh, for this morning. Uh, sorry? Oh. I mean, uh, are you accepting more questions for the uh, session? If, you, if people have more questions, great. Yeah, I mean, so I, I'm open. So if anyone has other questions. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. <laughs>